I pray by your spirit, Lord, that you will move through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm starting off already in, uh, in a bad mode because I forgot my object lesson. I was supposed to have my Rubik's Cube here. And, and for those of you who kind of are below 30, you may not even know what a Rubik's Cube is. I'm sure that you probably do. It's that kind of a, it's kind of a box and it has nine different colors or, or something like that. I forget how many colors it has. And, and you try and switch it and move it around. And, you, and it switches around so that you can try and get all of the same colors on all the same parts of the square or the block. And uh, I don't know if I have ever done it. Uh, just because I probably haven't been patient enough. But what happens is you see those people who do it so quickly, they can kind of, they, you see their hands, they're kind of spinning really quickly, and all of a sudden, boom, they put it down. And uh, I know for me, what I do is I take the plastic pieces off, and I kind of put them back on and say, there, I kind of cheat. But you, in life, you can't cheat like that. I've often found that um, life can be like a Rubik's Cube. There's a lot of shifting, there's a lot of moving, there's a lot of trying to figure things out. And sometimes you are trying to move things in the right direction, all of a sudden to realize that you've created something wrong on the other side of the square. And sometimes getting life together cannot be so easy. And so that's why we wanted to um, do this series, which was called God Put Me Back Together. Because I believe that that is the prayer of many of us. God, restore in me some of the things that have gone awry. And it's all based on a simple truth. That the moment you said yes to Jesus, and I'm not too sure if you come to that point. Hopefully you do soon. It's that point where you say, God, I'm going to give you my whole life. That point that you say that, that point where you agree to be a passionate follower of Jesus, that God is in the process of restoring you or creating you into his image. So last week we talked about restoring the missing piece. Next week we will be talking about restoring the missing perspective. You're not going to want to miss that. But today, I want to talk about restoring the missing passion Passion is an important thing. How do you describe or define what passion is? It is the emotional attachment that brings life and vitality to something. That's what I would say. We see it happen in a number of things. You, you have to ask yourself, what am I passionate about? There are people who are passionate about some things where people don't even give a care about it. What is your passion? All of us are passionate about something. We see it all the time. We see it in the sports world. This year, 2022, from, from the months of November uh, 21st to December 18th, you are going to see passion. And perhaps in North America, we don't recognize it enough. But in Qatar, the World Cup is going to be happening. And you will see firsthand what passion is all about. Because whether we like it or not, soccer is the world event in terms of passion. And the good thing is that Canada is in it. We actually have something to cheer about when it comes to that. But there, is, there are some things that, are, that are, we are just so passionate about and people get so upset. And really, at the end of the day, if you win a soccer game or not, it really doesn't matter. But we're passionate about these things. You know, what, what is it that we are passionate about? And we, when we apply that to our relationship with Jesus, that's an important question to ask. Let me, let me ask you in terms of your faith. If you were a car and passion was the gas in your car, what level would the gas tank be at this time? Like that's an important question because it asks you, where are you in terms of your passion? Without passion, you really don't go anywhere. There's a great quote. By Rick Warren. And, and this is what he says. He said, the creative force behind all great art, all great drama, all great music, all great architecture, all great writing is passion. Nothing great is ever accomplished in life without passion. Nothing great is ever sustained in life without passion. Passion is what energizes life. 
Passion makes the impossible possible. Passion gives us, gives us a reason to get up in the morning and go, I'm going to do something with my life today. Without passion, life becomes boring. It becomes monotonous. It becomes routine. It becomes dull. God created you with the emotions to have passion in your life, and he wants you to live a passionate life. Passion is what mobilizes armies into action. Passion is what causes explorers to boldly go where no man has gone before. Passion is what causes scientists to spend late night hours trying to find the cure for a dreaded disease. Passion is what makes a good athlete and turns him or her into a great athlete where they're breaking records. You've got to have passion in your life. And many of us, if we are to look back at our life and see the things that we've accomplished and the times that we were the most, had the most vitality, it had to do because of this thing called passion. It is that intense emotion, that motivating edge. Many times people will leave a marriage because it has lost the passion. Many times people will end a ministry that they're doing, going on to something else, because they will say, and I've heard this many times, I'm just not passionate about it anymore. Those people, those of us who have gone through times of burnout, where we have lit the candle at both ends, and all of a sudden we find ourselves overtired because we have worked on adrenaline too hard and too long in our life, one of the first things we begin to feel is the fact that we have lost the passion. The desire to go ahead is no longer there. And when passion is focused totally on God, we do great things for God. And when all of a sudden passion is siphoned out of us slowly or by whatever way, that's when all of a sudden things no longer become fun. We become lethargic in our faith. It becomes boring. And eventually something is missing. And the Bible, throughout all of Scripture, talks about this thing called passion, particularly when the people talk to Jesus and ask, what is the greatest command? It, he talks about passion. If you take a look at that passage of Scripture in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, this is what it says. This is, this is what Jesus says is the greatest commandment. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. I like the way the message puts it. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. So basically what Jesus says, number one commandment is this. You got to love God, but you got to love God with absolutely everything that you have. And this is kind of repeated throughout Scripture. You'll hear Jeremiah when they say, listen, you know, you can no longer preach his word. It says in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, well, if they say, I can't preach his word, it is kind of locked in my body as a fire in my soul. I can't not do it. David in Psalm chapter 42, as the deer pants for the water, oh, so my soul longs after you. My, my soul longs for the living God, it says in, in Psalm chapter 42, Colossians it, as Paul is talking to the Colossian church, he says, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart, not to, unto the Lord, not to men. Proverbs 3, 5, one of the most famous passages in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with everything in you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Like the Bible is not subtle about how it talks about passion, because I believe God puts that passion in us, that drive in us to serve him. And if you're living in a time, if you're going through a moment in your life, and the statement of your life starts with this, I used to be, then this message is for you. Because it's an indication that this passion has somehow leaked out of your life. I used to be active in church. I used to be excited about sharing my faith. I used to be excited about the life and the relationship I had with God. I used to be idealistic. I used to believe that God could do everything. I used to pray 
in a manner that was so powerful that I believed that God could do absolutely everything. Somehow, the vigor has left, though, and the vitality in my life. I remember that time, and I don't remember it anymore. Somewhere along the way, something has happened to make me lose momentum, to make me lose the luster. Somehow, I've just kind of been rendered ineffective, that I've become a bench warmer, that I've decided to let somebody else do it. And the gas tank, which was once on full, is running on fumes. Passion. We need passion. And we can sit there and say, well, it was just this recent pandemic. I don't know if it was the pandemic. I think it was the pandemic that revealed something that was already there in many of us. And I've asked myself, I, I spent time just before preaching this sermon, asking myself the important question as a pastor, what is it that causes us or a person to lose their passion? There has never, ever been a time where I've met someone who has lost their passion, who hasn't wanted it back. What can I say? What are, words can I give you that can bring us back to that point? Well, here's what I have learned about passion over the last number of years as I've prayed about this and as I have pastored for 30 years. One thing I've realized is this. Is that losing your passion is very much a slow drip that you just don't lose the whole, the whole tank at one time. I think passion slowly, slowly slips away. The other thing that I realized is, it, is that when a person loses their passion, it oftentimes doesn't happen on one occasion. Many times losing our passion is a cut by many small cuts. And the other thing that I have found about losing our passion, and this is important, is that often with losing your passion, there is a high level of spiritual battle. In other words, I think that Satan is very much in the process of us losing our passion. I think Satan will do everything he can. I think if Satan can get you to lose your passion, then he has won the battle on a number of fronts. And how does he does that? Well, I came across, um, I, like I created a, a list of the 10 Ds of losing our passion or the 10 Ds of, of, of losing the battle spiritually. And, and here's, here's what they are. I'll go over them really quick. One is distraction. Other things get in the way. Many times good things. You get derailed. You're on the right track, and all of a sudden you get on the wrong track. He gets you on the wrong track. Disappointment. Somehow God has let you down or someone has let you down. Discouragement. You just get down emotionally. Disillusioned. You get embittered. You get delayed. It takes longer than you thought it was going to. You become damaged. Something extremely hurtful. Something unfair has happened. You get drained. You get tired. You get distant. It's a slow fade over time. And the number 10 is this. Don't know. Can't put my finger on it. I'm not really sure exactly what it is. Maybe it's a combination of a whole bunch of things. But the devil will do anything he possibly can to keep you from being passionate. There's a reason for that. Because if you're not passionate, you never ever make it to the promised land that God has for you. You never make the destiny that God has for you. And Satan will keep, do anything he can to keep you from being effective for his kingdom. Not only that, if he can keep you from being passionate, he will keep others around you. He will keep your children. He will keep your grandchildren from being passionate. Many times the passion that you have will be seen by your kids, will be seen by your grandkids, will be seen by your great-grandkids. If they don't see the passion in you, how are they going to develop the passion themselves? It is possible, of course. Satan's not after us. If, you, if you're listening and you're older... Satan's target isn't you. Satan's target is your children. Satan's target is your grandchildren. And if he can cause you to lose heart and lose the passion, then the children that you have who are looking at you will not be able to see it as well. They're a spiritual battle. Or perhaps one of the best passages of Scripture or the best passage of Scripture which talks about this. It's a shocking passage of Scripture. It's found in Revelation chapter 2. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the, the seven churches and the letters, and I talked about the last church, Laodicea. I want to talk about the first church this time, 
in Revelation chapter 2. And in, in the first few verses of Revelation chapter 2, it talks about um, uh, the Ephesian church, the only church in the Bible where there are two letters given to it by two different apostles. And, and this is what it says. As the letter is spoken, and it is Jesus talking to the church of Ephesus through the apostle John. It says this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. It says this in verse 2, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at the first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Wow. That's pretty intense. It's pretty harsh because the reality of it is, is, is very sobering. It says in the King James Version, he says, I have somewhat against you. He says that you, you have lost your first love. It says forsaken in the New International Version. In the Greek, it says, it says the first love you have left. It wasn't so much that they had totally abandoned it, but it had lost its fervency, the depth of the meaning that it once had. The most amazing thing on this passage that I find as I look at it, as I read it, is that these were super good people. They did all the right things. Take a look at the things that they did. I know your deeds. I know the things that you have done. Your work ethic, that they had worked hard. It talks about their perseverance. It talks about their commit to, commitment to truth and weeding out false doctrine. The only way that you can expose false doctrine is to be strong in the word yourself. These people knew their Bibles. And it says this, they endured hardships for my name. Not only were they enduring for their own sakes, they were enduring in the name of Jesus. They were doing all of the right things. And it makes us ask the question, is it possible to be the perfect Christian and still have passion leak from your life? And his solution is simple. The remedy, he doesn't get quite into. He basically says this, reconsider, repent, return. It's basically what he says, realize where you are, consider your standing, consider what is going on, and turn back from it. doesn't give distinct directions. Do whatever it is. This is the priority in your life. Do whatever you possibly can, however it is. Find out whatever counseling. Do whatever. Heal whatever issue it is. But the, the biggest thing you need to do is to restore this thing which the Bible calls first love. And it's an important thing. And as I look at the church today, I ask, you know, do we reconsider? Do we need to repent? Do we need to take a look at, at where we are? What has happened? What's gone on in our lives? What has gone on in your life? When you take a look at your life, are you saying, I used to be? This was the case. If you check the, the dial, is, is the gas tank on empty? What is it that we need to be passionate about? I think we lose our passion in a number of ways. I'll just give three. And I think that they kind of pertain to the Ephesian church. And I think that they probably apply to us today. First one is this. To restore a passion for people. Like I think it's crucial that we understand that a passion, a love for God will inevitably display, be displayed in a passion for people. You know what it actually says? It says, I have somewhat against you because you have lost your first love. We assume that it means we've lost a lot of first love for Jesus. But it doesn't say that. It just says you've lost your first love. I think there's a reason for that. 
because it can be translated just as easily, people. Because if you love God, you automatically have to love people. It is possible to go on the spiritual merry-go-round and not love people. It says in John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Like you can't really misinterpret that. It's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. The important thing to remind ourselves is the fact that Jesus died for people. He died for you. He died for me. He died for everyone. He died for the person beside you. He died for the neighbor who's kind of grumpy. He died for that person who's an atheist and hates God and hates you because you love God. He died for those people. He didn't die for an edifice. He didn't die for an organization. He died for people. He didn't die for the chairs. He didn't die for the communion table. He didn't die for the photocopier. But he died for people. He didn't die for 440 Richmond Avenue, which, for those of you who don't know, that's the address of the church. It's the address of the place where I'm standing right now. He died for you. He died for me. He died for the people that we rub shoulders with on a daily basis. And it's an important thing to ask yourselves, am I doing things? Am I doing my acts of love for the church? Or am I doing it for people? It's an important question because sometimes we get in the church mode. Oh, I do this because the church needs it, and the church does it because the church loves people. But sometimes there is a, there is a loss in the translation, isn't there sometimes? All of a sudden, we're doing it for the organization. Sometimes we're doing it for the wrong reasons. But ultimately, what it comes down to is, is my love emphasis on that of people? I've lost a passion for people. We come into our churches, and we enjoy our time. Yet at the same time, there's a whole bunch of people who are hurting. There's a whole bunch of people who are hostile towards God, who need to know God. <laughs> Have I lost my passion for people? I always like to look at the life of people like Mother Teresa, who did absolutely so much and became world form famous for the things that she did. And, and she is known and she became fam famous not for her organizational skills, not for her abilities or gifts or her education, because she just simply loved people. I still love the quote that they had when, when the reporter said, I wouldn't do what you do for a million dollars. And she said, neither would I, but I would do it for Jesus. If you love Jesus, if you have a passion for Jesus, ultimately you have a passion for people. A church's temperature is recognized on how it responds to people. A congregation lives or dies by how its love is for people. If, if love if I love Jesus, I will ultimately show it in people. Because the gospel says that God so loved the world that he died for it. A passion. Passion for people. That's one. There's another one. It's a passion for people. God restore a passion for Pentecost. And, and we are, this is a Pentecostal church. We believe the moving in the moving and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that when a person decides to, to really give their heart to Jesus and when Jesus comes in, the Holy Spirit resides in our lives. But as Pentecostals, we also believe that there's a secondary baptism that gives us supernatural power to fulfill his will, to be able to go and make a difference in, and to have it supercharge our life and our faith and the initial physical evidences, speaking in tongues. And, and there's the whole passion of the fact. But if, you're, if your relationship with God and the element of power of Pentecost in your life ends at the speaking of tongues, we have forgotten all about the, the issue of the Holy Spirit. The important thing is to understand and that perhaps Ephesus um, had become so passionate over these things that they forgot, you know, and you become so, so self-dependent, and you see so many blessings happen within a church, and you see so many things happen, that eventually you think in your head that you can do things without the Holy Spirit. And when, as soon as you get to a point where you begin to go in your own power, and when you get to a point where you think, we're starting to do a good job here. Oh, things are, seem to be going well here. Things seem to be going in my life. And what happens is 
the Spirit of God takes a back seat, that's when the passion begins to leave. It becomes important for us to understand that we need to see the power of God every day in our lives. Not only do we need to see it in our lives, we need to see it in those people around us' lives, and we need to see it in our children's lives, and we need to see it in our youth lives. It's important that our young people experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Our young people are exposed to stuff that we never had to deal with. It's incredibly harder to witness in a society that's hostile towards the gospel. And it's hard to pass on an experience of God by hearsay faith. I don't want my son, I don't want my daughter saying, you know what, you can experience the Holy Spirit. I haven't experienced it, but my parents have. That God needs to move in every generation. That God needs to move in our hearts, in our lives. That he needs to be the living head. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit was given to us so that he, we could abide in him. And, and if all of a sudden we get ourselves to the point where the Spirit of God is no longer the forefront of what we do, how we operate, ultimately we lose a passion. And if our, and if our, our spiritual juncture in the, the Holy Spirit has to do with just us pleasing ourselves, then we lose it. The, the scriptures say in Acts 1 verse 8, But you will see power after the Holy Spirit has come unto you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the other most parts of the earth. And so the thing is this, that if your view, if your theology of the Holy Spirit does not include the Great Commission to go and be witnesses, we've missed the whole point. The passion of God comes through the Spirit of God that works through us and allows us to do great works through him. We need to have a passion for the Spirit of God. As soon as we don't have a passion for the Spirit of God, we miss out. Passion will ultimately leak out of us. It's kind of like a person who wins a $10 million lottery but never cashes in the, chick, the, the ticket. Oh, that's okay. I don't need it. We got this $10 million ticket. and We never ever use it because for some reason we think that we can do it on our own. You know, we can never somehow... We can never get ourselves to the point where we think we can experience a genuine move of God with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being a secondary participant. Have we benched the Holy Spirit? Have we sought to domesticate the Holy Spirit? God, I want you to move, but I want you to play by my rules. When the Holy Spirit takes on a secondary role, so will your passion. The two are inextricably fused together. Folks, we need a move of the Holy Spirit. A genuine move of God. We need to see the fire of God burn once again, where people are convicted of sin and saved by the grace of God, and people are delivered from the things that have kept them in bondage, where it's not comfortable to sit in church because the Spirit of God keeps knocking on the door of your heart, causing us to change. In fact, there's little hope without it. It's time to return to that which we first did, to reconsider the fact that the Holy Spirit needs to take preeminence in our lives. And allow him to do the work. Restore passion for people. Restore a passion for Pentecost. And finally, restore a passion for what I'll call the pursuit. The chase. It's an important part of our faith, isn't it? Faith makes sense when you give God everything. When you begin to chase everything after him, where God becomes the priority. You know what the biggest problem that Ephesus must have, may have faced? Was that it was the biggest, at that time, the biggest metropolis in Asia. They had a huge church, it says in church history, and the pastor was none other than John himself. Imagine that, that's pretty big bragging rights, is it not? You got the last remaining apostle, the one who knew Jesus, spent time with Jesus. He's the pastor of your church. You have thousands coming in. Hey, things are going pretty good. It's very easy at that point where you feel like you have arrived, that you can kind of coast. And what happens is you stop the pursuit. And all of a sudden, you lose out. It slowly leaks from your life. You begin to have to ask yourself, that my life needs to be a fulfillment, a lifetime process. That, that Mark chapter 12, verse 30 verse, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
That is a lifetime pursuit. There isn't a time where you have arrived at Mark chapter 12, verses 30, something which you continually do because it, it requires you to give everything continually. There's something that happens in a relationship when it loses the pursuit. You can say, hey, God, can you supernaturally help me to love you again? But he can't. It has to be something that you do yourself. It says in James, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. You can't pray for that. You just have to allow it to happen. I like Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. The, the key word is there is to keep. It's not automatic. It's not something that naturally happens. It's a choice. It's a discipline. Something that you must maintain. There's a thousand things that will keep you from being passionate about God. The devil has for sure done that. He's done everything he can to keep you from being passionate. And maybe you are sitting at your home today and you're saying, I know exactly what it is. I know exactly when it was. I know exactly what has happened. Or maybe you don't. It's just that there was a time when you were passionate. There was a time where he did have everything. And somehow it leaks out. And I'm speaking to you today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you today through this word. And he's calling you to say, listen, come on back. Have the passion that you once had before. How do I do it? Well, you do it whatever way you possibly can. If you've lost the love, get yourself off. Brush yourself off. Do whatever it is. takes. Get some friends. Have some prayers. Have people come in. Come and see the pastor. Do whatever you possibly can to get yourself back to the point where you say this. God, I want to love you again with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength. Because once you stop doing that, once the pursuit stops, so does your faith making sense. It's just as simple as that. Are you still chasing? When the chase is over, so is the passion. Are you still chasing? I think the verse that reveals, this verse reveals to me that you can Lose your song while still doing all the right thing. God, bring me back to personal. Wake me up to who I was before. I wish I could do that for you. But it's only the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now. I, I remember a time, and I've been in ministry for over 30 years, and I have had my ups and I've had my downs. But I remember a time where I was pursuing doing something for God, and I thought, I'm totally on. God is totally with me. And if it's something that God wants to do, then it should be successful, and it wasn't. And I remember scratching my head and going through a time, a dark time in my life where I was trying to figure out, well, why is it, God? If this is, I, I was doing exactly what you wanted me to do, and all of a sudden it doesn't happen, doesn't take place. And I just remember the, the going into a very dark place. I remember where I was asking myself, hey, see, I've been... I've been Devoting my life to you, God. And, and here I thought this is what you wanted. And all of a sudden I come to that point and, and you're not there. I open that door and you're supposed to be there and you're not. And I remember going through a time of sitting before God and saying, God, what is it that you want? What is it that you want to do? And maybe you kind of are doing the same thing. Maybe the Spirit of God has been tugging on your heart already. And I remember beginning to pray a prayer that slowly brought me back to the place where God wanted me to be. And um, I still find myself praying that prayer. Maybe, maybe you have prayed this same prayer. And it's a simple one, and it may seem weird to you. But it, it goes something like this. It says, God, I want to be the same person who sat at an altar as a kid, at youth camp, at children's camp, whatever altar, youth convention, who promised to passionately follow you. I don't want that person to ever leave. I made a promise at an altar when I was like 13 years old. Later on when I was 14. A number of times. Coming up to an altar saying, oh God, you got everything. I want to be passionate about you. I want that person to be the same in his mid-50s. Or whatever age you are at. Can I pray that prayer for you? Not too sure where you're going or whether you know Jesus or not. 
but I know he cares for you. I know that he wants you to passionately serve him. So God, I just pray for every single person who's here. For those who may have drifted far from the shore. For those who once had a passionate love for you. And maybe are still serving you, but that passion, that love, has somehow drifted, it's kind of leaked out, and you are calling us back to that first love. That priority, that, that just, that passion, that the thrill of serving you like we did when we first loved you with all of our hearts. I pray that it extends past ourselves into other people. Lord, restore the first love I ask. Do the work, God. Help us to reconsider where we are and to begin to walk back like the prodigal son walked back to you. And there's a God who will be running towards us with open arms. Moved by your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us. We are so glad that you did. I know that there's a number of things that you could be doing in other places. There are other